couples accrue ministry in conjunction with Deliverance Church Zimmerman. We are humbled to welcome you to today's seminar where we talk about parenthood and child upbringing. Your host for the day is me, Samuel Thuo, and my lovely wife, the mother to my children, the most beautiful girl in the world, Edna Thuo. And uh, before we start, I'll ask her to lead us with a word of prayer. Praise God. Let's bow down and pray. Our Father, once in heaven, we come before you this wonderful time. I want to thank you for being so loving and kind unto us, O Lord. We thank you for the gift of life that you've granted unto us, O Lord. And we come before you this afternoon asking for your guidance, O Lord, as we go into learning about parenthood and child upbringing, O God. We thank you for the viewers back at home and here in church, O God. May you lead us, O King of Glory. We thank you for Peter and Anne Masharia, Lord, as they lead us through this section, Jehovah God, Father. I want to pray that you may give them knowledge and wisdom, O King of Glory, that you've granted them, O Lord. Open our hearts, O King of Glory. When we live here, we are going to be blessed, O King of Glory. We thank you and we bless your name for this we pray, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Edna. Uh, allow me to start with a verse that is going to lead us into our discussion for the day. And it comes from Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, and it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Ladies and gentlemen, again, we are welcoming you to today's uh, seminar. And we have the lovely couple, a power couple within our Deliverance Church, Zimmerman Church. And uh, we will come them so that they can speak to us as couples. This is the Elites, the Elites group. The Elites group is the 6 to 14 people, uh, six, the people who have been married between 6 and 14 years. And we are also welcoming even the others. Maybe you are there watching us from home. Don't feel like uh, you don't belong to this group, so you'll not gain. This is for everyone who has children or expecting to have them. So come and join us, and we hope that you're going to get something. If you have a question, as they continue uh, to lead us in the discussion, please jot it down. You can send it to us, and then at the end, we are going to invite responses from the panel. So over to Peter and Anne. Thank you very much, Samuel and Edna. We appreciate the introduction. Um, as you've been introduced to us, she is Anne Macharia, and I'm Peter Macharia. We've been married for 22 years and a few months. Um, and we've been blessed with three children. We have a young adult in her 20s uh, at the university. We have a teenager in high school, and we have another one who has just entered into, te into teenagerhood, uh, she's 13, and she's in primary school. So we have experience across the, di the, 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 the different sectors of childhood, and uh, parenting is one of the most important topics everybody would be interested to know. These are gifts that God gives to you, and your work is to nurture them, is to mold them, is to build them, until one day, you will go back to God and say, these are the gifts that you gave to me. This is what I have done with them. And here they are, what this is what I have done with them. So you have a responsibility not only, to the, uh, not only to the people, not only to the country, not only to the church, but also to God, that you bring them in the right way. So I would like uh, Anne to take uh, the first front. Um, so she'll take us through, and then I'll be able to join us. Karibu sana, Anne. So thank you, Peter. That's a good introduction. We are happy to be here. And I pray that by the end of the session, we are going to be empowered. And we are going to be a bit more enlightened. Again, children are a gift from God. I'm going to start us off with some quotes that uh, people have come up with about parenting. Because the area is shrouded with mystery. And uh, a lot of people see it as a very weird place. Because uh, there's actually no child who comes with a manual. So you get married, now then you find yourself with children, and maybe no one has taught you before how to bring up these precious gifts. So it's good to learn, and to, we are going to learn together. Now as I said earlier, let us go through some quotes that people have come up with. In their struggle about parenting, there are some very hilarious things that people have observed. Now, one of them, 
Having children is like living in a frat house, you know, a frat house where you live with your friends, especially in college. Nobody sleeps, everything is broken, and there's a lot of throwing up. <laughs> Recipe for iced coffee, you know, when you want to take iced coffee as a parent, this is how you do it. Have kids, make coffee, forget you made coffee, drink it cold. <laughs> Another one. Now, parenthood is the scariest hood you will ever go through. And another one says, being a parent is like folding a fitted sheet. You know the bed sheets that come with edges that uh, have rubber buds and all that. No one really knows how. Now, another one says, they say it takes a village, of course, to bring up a child. Now, where can I get directions to this village? Now, having one child makes you a parent. Now, having two kids makes you a referee. Another one says, if you don't know where your kids are in the house, then turn off the Wi-Fi and watch them slowly appear. Especially for those with teenagers. Now, the reason grandparents and grandchildren get along so well is because they have a common enemy. And you can tell me who that common enemy is, eh? My parent. Now, another one. When your children are teenagers, it is important to have a dog in the house so that someone will be happy to see you. Now, the quotes create an image that uh, a lot of us would identify with, like especially the last one. You come into the house, you're tired, you have carried maybe even some goody goodies with you. You've been working for your children and you want them to be impressed that you're back home. But upon coming back home, there's nobody even to greet you. And you wish you had uh, someone who would come and say hi to you. All the same, despite these quotes and many things that have been observed and our own experiences, I know they attest to the same. No. We need to adopt a positive attitude. We need to learn what are the things that we can do to ensure that we carry out our God-given mandate. So Peter is going to take us through some things that we may be careful to observe as parents, whatever the age of our children. Now we have uh, small kids, we have teenagers, we have adult children, all of them in our houses. So Peter is going to take us through a few of those things. What are we likely to, despite those observations of some some hilarious and some negative things that we go through with our children. Now let's learn a few things that are going to help us as we raise our children. Thank you, Anne. As Anne has said, no child comes with a manual. Everything else you get, even if it's a car or an airplane or whatever, comes with a manual. But here it's for you to navigate and seek wisdom from God on how to take care of each, each child. We have made mistakes in our parenting. And I can tell you, I saw many things that my dad didn't do that I thought I will do. And I didn't know that maybe my child, if she came here, she'd be talking of the many things that dad didn't do that she thinks that she can do. Because we easily see what the other person is not doing. Um, the interesting thing is, within the parenting process, the, the, we have realized that every child is different. You can never treat them the same. Let me start by giving our example. Our firstborn, when she was born, she was this very cool girl, yeah? She would sleep, you go and wake her up thinking, Kwani Ameda or what? They, <laughs> you have to go and press your heart to feel that she's still breathing because she can sleep from midday, you come at allowed seven, you told she's still asleep, so you say, wake her up. Then when she wakes up, she'll take her, uh, she'll take her food, whatever it is, take her bath, and then go back to sleep maybe by nine, and she'll wake up the following day at six. And we had a very good time. The second born came, hallelujah, and I can tell you the experience was different. This one, we used to tiptoe in the house. You think she's asleep, you touch the door like this, she's awake. And we realize this one is different, and they have been different since they were born, until now, they're different. So the way we handle the firstborn, we cannot handle the secondborn in the same way. And quickly we had to understand every person is designed differently, maybe from God, 
And all we need to do is to understand, how can I take care of this child who is different? And in the course of our speaking, we will talk about how we have handled the different children and so forth. Our third born came, she had also her own uh, traits, which were also unique, and we also had to know, how do we take care of this? So parenting is not um, a book that one can say this is the way you handle children, because they will be different. You need to see, how can I take care of each one of them? Being very clear that your objective is that you may bring up children that will come and do their part in the society. Pleasing God, influencing the society, and being the best that they can. So if at the back of your mind you know what is the objective, why are you bringing up these children? What is it that you want for the children? Then it will be much easier. We have come from the age where our children were so dependent on us. So you may say that the first stage in child upbringing is that they, are, they will be dependent. They are dependent, they will tug on the mother's dress, they will hold on to you, they will wait for me to come to come and shower them, and a number of those things. But then as they mature up, they get to, initially we used to say from the age of teenage, nowadays they are growing up a bit early. From the age of 10, a number of them don't want to accompany you when you are coming to church. They are becoming independent. They want to be different. They want to walk away. They want to be their friends. They want also their voice to be heard. And sometimes, I'm sure in my house, they think this is the oldest person they have ever seen. Um, I look so ancient because some of the things I don't connect with what they're doing or what they want to say. But I'm telling them, also myself, I have my own knowledge. And now we need to see how do we work together? How do we move on? So that stage of independence is a challenge to many people. It comes with some, of course we view it as rebellion. It comes with a lot of where they want to assert themselves, they want to be listened to, they want to show that they are also growing up and so forth. And if you as a parent you are not prepared, then that will become a challenge. Then of course as they grow up, most likely they move away from school and start working. They start holding their own money. They see the challenges with the money. Maybe they get their own family. They go through the process of bringing up a child. They realize mom was right. After all, dad was actually right. One young man friend of mine, after he had had a lot of experience with his children, he went back to his father, whom they were fighting a lot. And he told the father, now dad, I think now I believe you, you are right. You are right. He took him somewhere and told him, sorry, please forgive me. I did a lot of mistakes. Now I have children in my house and I'm seeing what I'm going through. That that stage is what we call interdependence. We realize we need each other. As they're growing up, they realize that, mom, I can actually go and consult her. Dad, I need to, I have this girl and I need you to come and take me and so forth. Now we start talking to each other in a way that we are listening to one another. Not one telling the other, but both of you are now reciprocating that relationship. So don't forget, from dependence, when they are born, maybe up the age of about 9, 10, some up to 12 and so forth, then comes independence. They want to be independent of you. They see you as really not up to the things of nowadays, and so forth. Then they move on to the next one where they realize they actually need you. And they know what you are saying was actually right as they start applying it in their own home, which is interdependence. Now, Anne said I'll talk about some ideas or principles that we can share. From what we have gone through and what some others have talked about, about parenting. And the first one I would want to say is, what you do matters. The first idea or the first principle is not what you say. Because I know we say a lot of things. We tell our children a lot of things. But what we do is what they will pick. When we teach communication, we normally say that words only influence about 10%. The rest is what people see by body language, by nonverbal cues, and they are willing, including the tone of the voice. The children will observe you the way you treat visitors, the way you treat your parents, the way you treat your spouse,
The way you treat ABCD, the way you talk, and you'll find them talking the exact way like you're doing. As a young man, I, my dad used to stay away and he would come over the weekend. And we used to admire him quite a lot. And therefore, I think by the time I got to be of an age I could understand thing, he had started developing a kipara. And when he goes, especially during holidays, I would also shave my hair around here so that I could also look like my dad. Can you see the kind of impact he had on me? That is how much influence you have on your child. How you do your cooking, your daughter or your son is watching, and they'll most likely do it that way. Sometimes when you call them ngombe, oh, don't be surprised to hear them call somebody else, if not you, also a ngombe. That is the language. The way they see you walk, we have imitated many people. A, a man was walking one time to go to the pub where he had always gone to drink. Only to look behind him and he saw his young son walking, also staggering. Because he had seen the way the father walks, he was also staggering, now walking the way he had seen the father do. And Kube, this young man, this young boy, had observed that for several years as he was growing up. And he thought it's a nice style of walking that dad apprised. And therefore, one day, the father comes, drops whatever he had come with, and, and decides to go back to the joints to get one or two. And as he's walking, looks behind and sees his son walking towards him, staggering. And he asks the son, what are you doing? Where are you going? And he says, Dad, I also wanted, I, I like the way you walk. And you know, he's demonstrating the way the dad walks, yeah? And uh, the father realized what he is doing, Kubit is having such impact on the son. And the man took hold of his son's head. They turned back and he said, never again. He will never step in into any bar because he sees that what he's doing, his son is what he wants to do. And no matter what you tell your son, never drink, never smoke, never abuse people and so forth. They will pick it because that's what they're saying. You are the greatest role model for your child. You are the greatest influencer they are picking. You are the first person they see, the first president. I believe my dad was the most powerful man. That is exactly what your son or your daughter is thinking. So know that the things that you are doing in the house, you will see it with your child. What you do matters a lot. That is very important. The second one is, you cannot be too loving to your child. Now, let me explain this. There are many parents, and when we come to parenting styles, we'll be talking about this. There are many parents who want to become friends with their child. And therefore, they are not willing to play their role as a parent, as the parent. The one who corrects, the one who sees a behavior that is unbecoming and decides, I'm going to take action here early on. We want to be buddies with our children. We want to be whatever they say, we are agreeing. I heard a mother one time say, you know my daughter loves chicken. So if we go with her and don't buy her chicken, then it is a problem. So they are seated in these uh, eateries. Both of them are overflowing from the seats in the eateries. You know the chicken in, they are overflowing. And the child looks like somebody who is about nine years or so. But you can tell she's too big for her, for her age. They asked for each of them bajia, and then a whole chicken divided into two. Each of them their piece. And then, of course, the 500 ml of soda. And you could see them eating with a lot of relish. And though I had wanted to eat something, I decided I can't eat. I, I could almost see the fat getting into the body and so forth. The mother thinks she is treating the child, but she's destroying her own child. The mother thinks that she's, she, she's giving the best for the child, but she has the responsibility to take care of it. Mrs. Obama said, I listened many years ago, that until the children have taken their vegetables, they cannot watch TV or anything else. So they know if you want to watch TV or to be with friends or whatever you need to do, your vegetables per day you need to do. So 
you cannot enforce some of those things when you're trying to be a bad day with your children. You want your children to love you. You want your children to really not discuss anything bad about you. You are the leader in your house. You are the manager. You are the one who must give direction. You need to let them see where, you, where, where they are going. Help them to start seeing the future early on. So sometimes we spare the Lord. Did I say the Lord? We spare the rod. You know, I mean the R, you know. <laughs> we spare the rod and we destroy the child. Because we love them so much. And sometimes you see it in the supermarket. When the child is throwing tantrum and the father or the mother does not want to, you know, to discipline the child a little bit. And those parents stay with those children along the way. And the children behaving the way they want because the parent does not want to annoy these children. So loving your child too much will destroy. Um, there's a proverb where I come from. Ikipeda sana in a, now I'm looking for the right word. I don't know. <laughs> when it loves too much, it tears off the cord. You know the, the, the calf when it has been born? If the mother keeps on leaking and so on, it won't to clean the child until it tears off the cord. Because of, I don't know what that means. The, 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 the calf would just die. So don't know the boundaries. You are the parent and you must remain the parent to your children no matter what. The third thing that I would want to say, and this is also very important, be involved in your child's life. There are many parents who have no idea what their children are doing. Today, they left in the morning, or they're in the house, but the child left in the morning. And the father or the mother has no idea where the child is. The child is struggling with homework, and only the house help can help the child. Neither the father nor the mother is involved. They just look at the child, and they think the child wants money, and therefore they say, Ukitaka kununua, you know, whatever you know they like, you can pick some money, we have left some money there. Many years ago, not so many, a young lady came to see me. I was a principal in, one, in an institution, in a college, and she was struggling, and the teachers recommended, you need to go and see the principal. And I wanted to understand, what is the issue behind this girl? And the girl told me, since I got to know myself, my mom has never told me, don't do this. My dad has never told me, this is wrong. I've aborted three times. Once when I was in high school, and now twice when I'm in college. I go to carnival, I go to discos any time that I want because my dad is a high fryer. My mom is a businesswoman. They are so busy with their businesses, they normally arrive home at around past midnight and so forth. And when they come, each of them, they are tired, take a shower, go to sleep, early the following day, they will not even ask, did you do your homework? What did you do? You are not involved in your child's life. So the girl now was saying, I wish I could have somebody who will tell me, you will not go to Canva tomorrow. You will not do ABCD. That is not right. That is what she was yearning for. At least a parent who cared. For her, a parent who cared is a parent who will tell her, as my daughter, this is what we want you to, how to behave. This is the way we want you to look at life and so forth. So I had to assign her another lady teacher to work with her. And with the time, I wanted to hear how is it going. And then the teacher was telling me, this girl just wants to be hugged. She just wants to cry on your shoulder. She wants to be listened to. And that's what I've been doing. And to this day, many years down the line, they're still very close friends. She has been influenced by a teacher because the mother or the father have not been there for her. They have not been involved in their life. You are preparing somebody that you need to give to life, that you need to give to the society after some years. And you'll tell the society, this is what I have been working on. I'm now releasing to the world. Let them come and influence the world. And they can influence negatively because we know them. They can also influence positively. My desire is, let's be involved in our children's life. If we don't do it, 
and they don't get somebody else to mentor them, they'll be mentored by the wrong people. They will look for them elsewhere. And the consequence is disastrous. Parenting is good. It has its own challenges, but remember, it's only for a short while. In a few years' time, you will look for those children that were giving you headache. You will look for those children that were jumping all over you, that were pouring porridge everywhere, and you will find none. And you might have to go to look for your sister's children to come and stay with you because the house is so big and lonely, or you may have to go and ask for grandchildren, bring them, they stay with me. But because you missed an opportunity to be involved in your children's life, and take over. So thank you, Peter. As he was talking about uh, getting involved in our children's lives, now I thought about school. You know, you take your child to lower primary, and then in a few years, they're in upper primary after that, they're in high school, and you realize after high school, or even in high school, now that child starts now belonging to everyone out there. Now, the only time you can get actually involved, almost 24 hours, is when they are younger in primary school and in pre-primary. And that reminds me that uh, one time, now our firstborn, now she had done so well in class five, and she was position one. He was busy at work. I was busy at work. So somehow none of us was available to come and attend the ceremony in school. And uh, the person who warned me told me, don't do that again. Now that child cried because there was nobody to really be with her as she received her trophy. And it, if the, the whole hall, you can imagine how we behave when number one is called. And I made up my mind and we made up our minds that we will always be there for them. Now that kid was not called again to that, uh, that stage in that school. So it would have been such a privilege for her to see her parents. Now let's get involved in our children's lives. Let us be there, especially in school activities. Now the school is a small world for the child, just like the way my workplace is a world for me. Now the school means the world to the child. They have just home and school, and school is where they're interacting with people from out there. So please get inside there, get not to miss any school activity. And as you are not uh, in this country, or the child is studying somewhere else where you can't go, or you are indisposed, that means you are unwell. It means everything. And part of being involved is physical and mental involvement. You know, when we're in high school, if my dad chanced to come for visiting, anakuja tu na gazeti na anakaa kiangalia saa hii kitu itaisha saa ngapi, you know? Now let us be there. Now what he communicated to me is that he just came because it was a parents' day. I wanted to experiment to dogo to dogo at kubuki and a pita na hapo, and then he goes to smoke, comes back. <laughs> we see a few other stands and all that. Now when we attend our children's functions, especially in church or in school and wherever they are, and even when they are teenagers, some of those parties they attend, if there's a birthday, when Peleke drive them up to the venue or be with them and then go pick them up. In that case, you are in charge and you instruct them. You are a bit informed. Who is with my child? Where are they and what are they doing? And as Peter has said, now time lapses very fast. In our house, we actually plead with them to take us to the shops. And sometimes you want to leave church and go to the supermarket. They are like, ah, ah. We want to watch something on Nickelodeon and I don't know what. So sometimes... It is good to take advantage of the time that you have and the age of the child, because one day you try to get involved and they might look at you and wonder, where have you been? So let's get involved so that we can actually also control what they, they are learning from the environment. You discover, like what we said earlier, it takes a village to raise a child and somebody is still looking for that village because <laughs> the child is... Uh, becoming a bit uh, not easy to handle. So there's a lot of influence outside there. So it, you can only know what is happening by getting quite involved. Now let's move to another good idea that we can adopt in raising our children, whatever the age is, adopt your parenting to feed your child. Adopt your parenting to feed your child. Now, children go through stages. At one time, they are very small kids, and then we see them develop. 
Now they get into puberty and adolescence. Then after some time, they are young adults and then adults. Now at each particular stage, we cannot remain the same. I know some of us came from a, a background where nothing actually changed. Nobody even realized that you had grown up. Even now, in your 30s and 40s, if dad calls, you're like, hey, what has he said? You know, it is still said shivers down your spine. Now, let's adopt styles that really fit our children. Now, when they are young, between zero and 12 years, may I say zero, because it's possible to train them immediately after they are born. Now, up to 12 years, now the children obey their parents. So you need to set rules. So set rules for them so that they can follow. Because the, the concept of the parent in this case, you are the world, you are everything to them. Like Peter said earlier, he would look at his dad and see everything there is in the world for him to see. No, it was in the dad. So in this case, the child just needs to obey what is said before them. They may not have interacted with the world out there so much, and their concept or the kind of relationship they have with their parents is their relationship of obedience and everybody else. So we can only help them by setting rules which they can follow. Then after that, as they grow older, now into their teenagehood, between teenage teenagehood and young adulthood, now this child is getting exposed to the world. And as Peter said earlier, now they are learning to be independent. They are learning, it is not only about mom and dad. I have friends out there who they might listen much more to than they would listen to us as parents. So the boundaries are expanding. And therefore, it is stopped just being the rules, the do's and don'ts in the house. Now you also want to ease up some space. This child has gone to high school. This child has friends in the hood. Now this child can go to the salon alone. And this child, most of them actually, you can even send them to their great pa's or grandma's home alone if it's not very far. They can go to town. You can put them in a mat and they go to town. So you are expanding their boundaries. So the concept of obedience now gets a bit relaxed. And the stage two from obedience, we have submission. Now submission here means they have alternatives. When I tell my daughter, please come and be here by six. She went to town to buy earrings. She goes to Du Bois Road to buy earrings. And I tell her, you have to be here by six. Please be here by six. Now, sometimes she can come at seven. She wants to stretch that a little bit. Kitabo, what I used to do is that I would go and buy them myself. You know, I make a whole day's trip to go and buy them and then bring to them. And we have three girls, so you can imagine what kind of shopping is that. Eh? Well, you know, I want gold, I want rose gold, I want silver, I want this, and I want this color and stuff like that. But now I set them to go. That tells you their influence and their experience is also a little bigger. They have their friends they can listen to. They have other people that they can listen to. So they only relate to you as a parent in terms of submission. Submission means devotion by choice, you know. They have very many choices, but they choose to devote themselves to that which you have taught them. So in this case, as a parent, you may not stand on a pedestal and tell them, rule number one in this house, rule number two in this house, rule number three in this house. No. What you need is now to have a negotiation sort of. Let them understand. Why do I ask you to come by six? Because it is risky out there. You, you can lose your phone. We don't have a way of communicating and stuff like that. So you explain, you expose them a little bit to the world, and then they choose to obey their parent. Not because it's a rule, they have very many other alternatives, but because there's an understanding between you two and they submit to your authority. Now later, when they are adults, now this is where the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. Now the relationship in adulthood is that of honor and respect. 
seriously, a parent cannot now come and tell me, especially my mother and my dad, they cannot just tell me, Anne, we want you home tomorrow. It cannot happen. In fact, a lot of time they ask, hey, are you people coming home? Hey, what have you decided? Hey, we would like to see you and stuff like that. Now, compare and contrast that with when I was growing up, you know? Yeah, it's here or nowhere else. It's here and nothing else. There were no alternatives. So at our age, when we are adults ourselves, now we only honor and respect them. So every, for example, now uh, at this stage, my dad can only offer me advice. He can there. The dad can only offer him advice, and our parents can offer us advice. But we relate to them in a way that just shows respect and honor to them. So let's adopt a style at every stage that is appropriate. So we move from obedience, a relationship of obedience to rules and regulations. Then we expand that a little bit to submission because they have a million choices. And then we move on to honor and respect. Okay. The next thing, and I have alluded to this in the other point of setting rules, is that we need to establish and set rules. Now, we have said the first kind of relationship we have is based on rules and regulations, and that is a relationship of obedience. Now, we need to set them and ensure that they are adhered to. Now, I am a teacher. I have taught uh, both high school and uh, the university level. Now, where I work now, we tell our students, you cannot have that kind of hair that is standing on the head. You won't get past the gate here and you won't wear ragged jeans to class, you know? So we have empowered the people at the gate, and they ensure. In the morning, sometimes he would drop me, and it's drama at the entrance to the college, because boys and girls are there combing their hair, you know, before they get to inside the college. And we tell them, this is it. It happens to be a government place, so they don't have many choices. And now we take time to explain to them, we are not being barbaric. We are not backward. We are training you for the job world and the world to come. Now the same thing we do with primary school children and high school children. The reason as to why there's a bell in a primary school and a high school and there's no bell at the university is because the rule and regulation in primary school and high school is supposed to establish self-regulation in the child, such that later in life, they will be able to wake up, go about their stuff. If we do not set rules and regulations for our children to follow, it will be very difficult for them to be self-regulated. So right now, we chase them around, make that bed. No, you, can't, you have to eat your vegetables. Now, for example, the example that Peter gave us here of Obama's children, they do not get to watch TV until they have eaten their vegetables. Now, that is not punitive. It is teaching that child that every class of food has its value in the, in the body. So you don't want a family that feeds on uh, noodles, you know. Your daughter has gotten married or your man has brought a daughter home and what they know to cook in the whole house. The only thing they can do is to boil water and noodles and eggs, and that is food. No, we shall have a lot of health complications. So we must set rules and regulations for our children and ensure that they are followed so that later in life, when we are not there, and that does not mean when we are out of this world, when your child goes to college, you are not there. And there's nobody to wake them up. They can as well not attend all those classes and the teacher is just ticking. You know, I've seen organizations whereby they just actually clock in electronically. No, your child will not sit at that exam until they have achieved 75% attendance. Now that cannot be built in a child unless there were rules and regulations at home that taught the child there is time for, for everything. And you don't answer like this to adults. You don't do one, two, three. And that ensures that there is self-regulation in the child. So let us set rules and let us not be afraid to ensure that children stick to those rules. Because we want to sit back when we are a bit older and be happy. I see my father-in-law, he, he has many sons, 10 of them. 
and he is happy the way he is seeing them coming home with their wives. They are not fighting. They are, the wives are cooking. Now me included, we are there cooking and all that. And he tells them, now you, you have, I can see I did something. He's quite old. He's 86 now. And he tells them, now I can see uh, you have followed the rules as I taught them to you. But it wasn't easy for them to follow as he tells me. So Peter, what do we do next? I, 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 may, I may continue from where Anne has left that uh, I may have been the first one to break the rules. <laughs> because in our home, coming home after six was anathema. It could not be, if anybody, nobody could think about it. And now I'm in high school, I think I was a form two, and I thought, I I'm already a man. I want some space, I want some freedom. You know, that independence. So I stayed in Naivasha until the last bus. I think it used to pass Naivasha at six. So by the time I got home, it was around nine, and my dad came out with a big torch, you know, the big ones, and focused on my eyes without talking. And he asked me, where the nanny? You know, of course he can tell because he's the one who has the torch. I had to explain myself and so forth. So I had to explain to him. And <laughs> but that was the beginning because I am the type who would go and sit with him. Normally he would sit in the table room alone. The others for a cook kitchen. But I would go and sit with him now. And we go and talk, update him on how the term has been and so forth. And I, I think that by itself, to this day, we talk a lot. We sit together. Everybody else will go, but me and dad, we can talk. And we can lead a, and, and we can be, uh, what do you say? Yeah, nowadays we consult a lot. We consult a lot. Actually, many things have to be consulted. But started from where he saw, I'm responsible. I am not doing it just for the sake of or to go and do evil things, but I'm responsible, and he allowed that to happen. So everybody knows that I gave independence to the rest of the others because it was easier for the others to come through. Let me mention something about parenthood. You will go through stages, and some of you have gone through stages. One day, I come home from work, and I find my, my wife, I think, I don't know whether she was screaming or, or crying out. And <laughs> And I asked what happened. Kube, she came with coins and gave our first daughter the coins as she goes to change and so forth. So how she's playing with the coins at the table room. And the girl decides to put them in the mouth. And the next thing, she has swallowed, I think, a 20 bob. So the, the shock when I walked in, the shock I found in the house, and I'm telling her, no, this, this, this is okay. You know, because I could see she was all, no, 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 no. Let me have to. So we rushed to the hospital. Um, we were just staying behind here. We rushed to the hospital. And the doctor just told us, give the child hard food. Don't give the child water. Give her hard food. Then tomorrow morning, you'll see the coin in the, in the poo, poo That is exactly what happened. Now, I was sharing this story with another parent. And they told me, then they rushed to one of the big hospitals. And immediately, the doctor said, this is an operation. And they paid, I don't know, 120000 for the coin to be removed. Another one who was there also said, mine had also the same. And we also went to another hospital. We paid 90000 And I was telling them, it's because as you, as you are growing up, <laughs> as you are running to parent and so forth, you will go through some challenges. Some of them you only need to ask a more experienced parent. When we were growing up, not when we were growing up, when we had our first child, really we were growing up also. <laughs> because it was such a big challenge. The doctors are calling me Baba June. Me, I'm wondering who is that? Me, I'm, it's not me. I'm Peter, you know? Until the nurse rushed and told me, it's you we are calling. You know? And yes, oh goodness, from now on, I'm a father to somebody. We almost cooked our child. Cooked, <laughs> and I <was> shocked. <laughs> in that, I came from Yadarwa. Me, I knew a child is normally put on a lot of clothing. You know, a lot of clothing. As a sikia baridi, and as a pattern pneumonia. And therefore, and uh, I think half from Nyeri, it was also the same thing. So there will be a boshori, you know, those kofias, tough ones. There will be all those, plus the shukas and the you know, a lot of clothing. Then the child was getting those things that come out with water. 
the rushes. And the rushes grew big, such that her skin started coming out. And her hair started falling off. And we went to hospital. We, bought, we were sold some, you know, expensive drugs to give her. Yeah, but this thing is not improving. Why? Because we are still cooking the child. You know, we are still putting a lot of clothing on the child. Until one lady, some pastors who are friends of ours, came visiting. The, the lady was a nurse. And she came and looked at our baby and said, you are going to kill this child. And she started removing clothes, you know, one after the other. And I can tell you there were many. The child was fully protected from many colds. One from the other. And then they said, when the child is inside the house, because I can also see the ventrition is not much, you don't even open windows, let the child stay in a vest. Now, for us, that was a big shock because it was a total, what we call, paradigm shift. It's a total mental shift. We had known that a child must be, but because it is where we came from, the environment we were in, now we are in this environment, and this is the way things are. But we did things the way we had always seen. And I'll tell you, there are many things that you saw your parents do that you did not like. You say, I'll not do it. But you know, the moment you open your mouth, you speak like your mother. You speak like your father. You want to you behave like unconsciously because that is the environment you grew in. They influenced you in a big way. Two things can happen. You can either decide you hate everything about your dad or your mom and go completely on the other side, or you will be exactly like them. And you'll hear the way you are calling your children is exactly how your mom or your dad used to call you. And the way you are relating with them, the kind of punishment and so forth you have adopted. That's why we normally say, attending seminars like this, reading a lot of materials, equipping yourself will help you because you are eroding a lot of the things that were put in you unconsciously. They are part and parcel of you because you inherited a lot of nature from them and they also nurtured you. The, 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 the nurturing environment you grew in was first influenced by the parents. That's why you most likely be like your mom or your dad. So, Parenthood is, as I said, it's interesting. You discover who you are as you move on. And you discover that each of my child, I need to handle them differently. Now, Anne has talked about setting rules. And one of the most important things about parenting is being consistent. That what you said yesterday is what you'll say today and what you'll say tomorrow. But if today you allowed this child to do this, and when the other one came, maybe who looks a bit weakly, and you're sympathetic, and you allow them to go with this, then the children will say, you favor this one, and the other one, you don't like them, and so forth. So being consistent becomes so important. That what you say, if you punish for this, tomorrow they know they cannot repeat this because you'll be the same. Actually, as psychology said, that the greatest tool for discipline that any parent has is consistency. If you can use it, if you can be the same today and tomorrow, they know, sometimes we look at our parents, and I keep on wondering, when we were growing up, and I have had the same with my wife, our dad was terror. You know terror? Having been a school, a high school, a primary school teacher and a, and a headmaster, we used to get six of the best. As, as, as we were growing up, we would all lie down. And as Anna has said, we are many, yeah? But because you would come over, we cared. The mistakes you did on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they will all be enumerated. And now dad will punish. And we will be caned, lying down. But you know what? Today, when we sit with him, we tell him, thank you for the way you disciplined us. This is a time we appreciate because he would always tell you why he is beating you. He will not take a slippers from anywhere or a strap from anywhere and so forth. And he had reused his own heart. We knew that heart was supposed to be greeting you, but we were not getting hugged. Today I should use my hands for hugging my children, yeah? But he would cane you. There was that kiboko. And there kiboko. 
unajua ni kiboko gani and you come unajituma chini and you receive your six of the best and you explain to why i listened to another parent who was also staying nearby he used to be a member of this church he was telling us the way he he disciplines the children and he was saying normally the child will come and first confess what they did they need to say this is what i did although the others have reported the child we need to say it themselves so that they hear it as they speak it then they say what should they have done instead so they say what is the right thing maybe they used an abusive word to their sibling now they are asked what should you have done then they go ahead and they say this is what they should have been done so they are asked what is the consequence because the parents although it is not written they have clearly stipulated what are the consequences of not behaving in the right way and the son or the daughter would say this one it is two kings or mchipis this one is three and so forth and therefore they be so it lie down and they will be kind their three strokes then they will be asked so how can you show that you have repented the requirement is that they need to look for a bible fast and read and say why they will not and then they would pray together <laughs> so <laughs> that was one of the elders that used to be in my home fellowship and uh, his discipline his children are up there they are all doctors some of you when i mention you will definitely know him they are doctors some in the us in south sudan and so forth he was able at that time the parent the children thought our dad is terror our dad is abcd today they thank him because they know he helped them to walk in a particular way be consistent let your children know that how you told them you'll beat them don't just threaten them they get used i'll tell you one of the reasons why children don't even fear mothers beating them sometimes is because mama has been shouting nitakuchapa from morning nitakuchapa akimchapa nikasipa saa moja hata mtoto anacheka they don't they stop now taking discipline seriously you don't have to beat by just speaking with a the child they understand and they can follow as i was telling the other group the other time i have not beaten a child for the last 20 over 20 years i have never but they are disciplined all let me not say because when you have a young child you never know but at least they have followed whatever we have been able to share uh, talk with them being consistent then you are saying avoid harsh discipline sometimes some parents are too harsh you see the way they are beating their children it's like they are beating an animal you know i have heard of parents who will say mimi nitakufuja mguu you know i can break your leg na nikupeleke hospitali na unionage hapa ama nitakuwa na nipate mwingine now when you do such kind of threats it's not good don't use such kind of things you will not do it so don't give those kind of threats sometimes even the beating some some children would receive you think they are fighting with an an equal you know with a mature man like me that I can take my you know my heart i hit my daughter and it has been a problem i'm sure we all heard the story of a father who came with a nice car had just bought come and found the child has drawn some nice picture of mom and dad kwa hiyo gari and the father could not understand my new car you have just scratched and he took some metal rod and hit the fingers just like the parents you hear they burn their children's hearts because they have taken a 20 bob they he hit the fingers and the fingers broke by the time he rushed the hospital the doctor said this ones must be cut and the father could not sit and watch his son grow with his with a stamp in his um instead of fingers he committed suicide there are many who are in prison today parents because of burning their children for something they did beating their children mercilessly cutting them with knives and so forth unnecessary beating you take a stick you hit the child 
and I'm sure you have heard of one of their children was rushed to hospital because the parents did. Don't be harsh. Yes, sometimes it's good to use the rod as the Bible says. Sometimes it's good to take some disciplinary action. Discipline is important. Even in your place of work, one of the most important tools is that everybody must be disciplined. And because every institution must have rules and regulations, a home is an institution. There must be established rules where somebody knows if I break this one, these are the consequences. And let them know very well the consequences. But don't be offering harsh. You will alienate yourself. Actually, they say children that are brought up by parents that are very harsh, who beat and beat and so forth. First, they tend to perform very poorly. Some children who had stopped um, wetting the bed, they start wetting much later on in life because the parents have been very harsh. Try to use positive words, encouragement, words that can build them. Bless them. Be the one who blesses them in the morning. Speak those words that they will not hear from anybody else. It helps. I said in another setting that when I moved from a certain position and I, moved, I improved a little bit. I was number 98. I improved to number, I think, 76 or something like that. I was so celebrated at home. My dad so celebrated me that I didn't know whether I'm the one who had done better than my sister who was number two. I, I, you know, the way my dad celebrated me, Kube is looking at the improvement because my, my sister was used to that position. Me, I was coming from, and he told me, you know, now you will move from there, you'll come to 60. And I can tell you, I followed the path. That by the time I was clearing my primary school, I was one of the best students. But started in a very poor. And I can associate it with some of the challenges that I went through, harassment by teachers and so forth. But there was a guy who was always on my side. And every time I bring the report form, never rebuked me for it. And he told me, you will do better next time. Be supporter number one for your child. When they are going for those games, as Anne has said, we chose, even if they're just participating in some swimming, I will leave a critical meeting and be there when their school is swimming, when my daughter is swimming. I will leave a critical meeting to be there when the other one is playing basketball. I will do whatever it takes. Everything else must stop when my child is getting involved. This is a lesson that we learned after the incident that took place, and we decided even if both of us can't be there, we try to be there, both of us. But even if both of us can't be there, one of us must be there. We need to be there and start with our children. Then explain every rule and the decisions very well, especially when they are growing up. Sometimes they need to air their views. L listen with them. Sieta Mungu anatuabiaga, come, let us listen. If God can give us that a privilege that we can listen with him, why don't we want to listen to the children? Sometimes we say, because I have mimi diya mzazi na sita abiwa na mtoto. Have you ever heard that statement? That statement has been said by many parents. I am the parent. What I've said is final. And the children had a very good view. So especially as they are growing up, they are becoming teenagers, young adults, now you start having a sitting and you discuss. You try and see what is the best option for this. Of course, you as the leader, you as the manager in the house, you as the ultimate, the one who be held responsible for anything that happens, you have the final say. So guide them, show them why you have choosing this direction, listen to them, you may pick something and appreciate them for their contribution. Um. So thank you, Peter. Now, something else also to note is that uh, we need to treat our children with respect. Whatever age they are in, they could be toddlers, they could be young adults, whichever age they are in. A lot of them, I think they are around, uh, they are getting into adolescence and we're still having babies. At whatever level or whatever stage of development your child is in, now treat them with respect. Now, oftentimes, we have heard that if a child, you, a child throws a tantrum in the supermarket, what you do is that you take them aside and you spank them and tell them, no, this is what we had agreed when we left the house. And I told you and blah, blah, and all that kind of stuff. Now, the reason as to why we take them aside is because you don't want to embarrass your child. 
in front of everyone. No, they may get such a bad feeling that affects their development and their perception of you and their self-esteem. So you have a child who have a very poor concept of self and self-esteem takes a dive. And you don't want such a child because they'll never be able to express themselves. They'll never be employable or even be able to keep employment. So whatever the age, now try and not embarrass your child, not only by kidding them in front of their friends. You know, sometimes some parents say, Kuja, I'll beat you in front of your friends so that they may all learn and they see what, my, what is likely to happen to them. No, that's not the way. Let's not embarrass them at whatever age. Now, when they are a little bit older and they're getting into adolescence again, now protect that image they have created and the perception that their friends have of them. Don't call them names or even punish them in front of their friends. If you have tried. Now, I saw it once when our 13-year-old was with her friends and they were standing outside our gate and I had always told them, if you visit or if your friends visit, let them come into the house. So let's not stand outside the gate because you never know what they could be exposed to or what they are saying. Whatever it is they want to say, whatever it is they want to cook, let them come and do it inside the house. And one time I told her, you, you've not even washed the dishes and you're here chatting with your friends and I, you could have asked them to come inside the house and then you wash the dishes together. Now I looked at that girl and I was like, I shouldn't have told her that in front of her friends. She cannot answer me back. But I have affected her perception of self. So let us learn to respect our children. Treat them with respect at whatever age and level. Now lastly, among the ideas that we had is that it is our responsibility as parents to teach our children the ways of God, especially the word of God. Now it is our responsibility. It's not the Sunday school teacher's responsibility. It is ours. Now, if you read Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7, this is what it says. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou liest up. Now, the Sunday school teacher is not there when the child is eating, sleeping, and rising, but you are there as the parent. Let's, let's read the word of God to them. Let's also encourage them to read. Ask them, what did you learn? Ask them. Of late, I've learned to buy them devotional books. Now, there are very many in the supermarket. Go pick one. Unapia mtoto so that every day they have a verse that they are reading. and write, Buy one with some spaces for writing. And that encourages them. With time, you want to see exactly what they have been reading and doing. Teach them. Have devotions at home. Give them a chance to participate. Even if they are one, they are two year old or three year old, there's something they know about God, a Bible story they have had, and encourage them. So that is our responsibility. And that tells us then, as parents, we must do the same. Remember the first principle? What you do matters. It's not what you say. If you don't read the word of God, if your children never see you pray, if the children never see you sit in church and kneel down and worship, how are they going to do that? It's naturally these are the things we want our children to do and we wish and hope that our children would do. That they would have a passion for God. That they would be connected with their maker and they would live such godly lives. Now remember our mandate in marriage and as couples is to bring up godly offspring as per Marakai. So how are we going to teach that? Demonstrate it and also give them a chance to do it. Let it not be that a child is introduced to God when they come to church and then after that, now it becomes somebody else's business. Especially our dear fathers, we must go to church, let's read the Bible, let us lift our hearts in worship and let us show a true passion for God and our children will run from us. Now, having said that, those are some positive things we can try, and they are, they are time-tested. Now, there are different styles that we adopt as parents, and we would run, or do we like to run through a few of them? And I'll ask Peter to take us through that pretty fast. Thank you, Anne. Um, the way you bring up your child 
determines who and what they will become in future. We have heard about the Awaris, the Moody Awaris family, because that Agrican priest inculcated a culture of children who feared God and who desired to do the right thing. And the 13 of them became who is who in their homes. And I'm sure there could be those families that you know back in your upcountry or wherever who lived in a way. One of them is uh, uh, another friend of mine. It happened that I had two of them as my, my, uh, they, we were working together. And one of them told me when we were young, we feared being sent to their home, now to the other's home. Because when you go there, before you are given that panga, you know your dad told you, go and get me a panga from so and so. You will first be told to sit down. You will be preached to and you will be asked to get born again. And they told me they feared getting that home. They thought, mahidi, because those boys, when they were young, they used to pray in the maize plantations. They used to, the, the parents used to pray. The children copied the same until the neighbors feared getting into that home. Until the first one went to Alliance High School. The second one went to Mango High School. The third one went to Jiri's High School. And people said, these people, although they are making noise, it seems there's something they are doing. Because from the village, anybody going to a national school was a big thing. But could be the parents were putting in them not just prayers, but the general discipline of a child. So they inculcated something in them. Today, some of them are pastors. I think one of them has been here to preach to us several times. They are pastors. They have open churches. They are leaders in their own right. They are doing well. You can do that by just starting right. Make your home to be where they hear about Jesus, where they hear about God, where they learn discipline. As they go out, the teachers are only reinforcing what you have been building in your children. Now, many parents apply different styles when they are taking care of their children. There are those that will be dictatorial in their approach. There are those that will be authoritative. There are those that will be uninformed, and there are those that will be permissive. As we go through them, Check where you belong. Check where you are. And then you can say, how can I improve my, myself? The first one, let's look at the authoritarian, the dictatorial, the disciplinarian. They are known because they say, because I said so. It's final. What mom said, what dad said is final. Children have no right to be heard. They should only be seen. What they will eat, whatever they will see, they can only, they should only be seen. No child talks, no child gives their views. And therefore, even later alone in life, they, they, they know I, I, I can only be seen. There are the people who will come, even if you give them a platform, they can't speak. Their self-esteem is completely messed up. They don't have self-esteem. Give them the pulpit like this. Give them a chance even to pray when you visit their homes. They can't speak for themselves. The problem started back there. It is started at home. We can change our ways. We can, and, and, and it gets worse when we are doing it with the children who are teenagers and young adults. And we still want to be authoritarian we want to be dictators. We want to be disciplinarians, not people who do correction. We are not collecting the children. We are just, pain makes us feel like we have achieved. When we cause the children to regret, when we cause the children to be sorry for their behavior, instead of the correction that we do, that is what drives a person who is authoritarian. And we are saying it becomes very tricky later on in life. Those children also become liars. To escape from punishment, they have to keep on giving a lot of lies. So, when we become too authoritarian in our homes, we are building somebody else that we must look for a way of survival in the world. Part of it is, as we have said, lack of self-esteem. Secondary, 
people who cannot articulate themselves or represent themselves in any way. That day, they are poor performers. They also tend to perform poorly. The environment was so harsh, that timidity becomes a disadvantage. And I have seen, in the name of respect, and Africans are, we are known for this, have you seen people who almost want to go down on their knees when they're greeting you? People who really look timid when they're greeting somebody who is up there, or somebody they perceive to be very senior? Now, this emanates mostly because of our upbringing, because our parents, they were, that parent-child relationship was, the gap was too big that the child could not say anything. Let's help our child to start being assertive in life, to be able to articulate their issues, to be able to even to start and say, no, I think there is a mistake. Suppose we did something this way. I, 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 I tell my children, I was the first person to tell the deputy principal in our primary school that the answer he has given is wrong. And I stood my ground and I told him, no, that is not what, and he could not believe it. The, everybody who said, who, who is supporting him? They raised their hands, justified, they were beaten. Now I was told, if I can't justify to satisfy him, I'll be beaten and go and come with my parents. But I had done my, my homework very well. So I was able to explain, including the dictionary meaning of the terms that were used. And the guy said, now I understand you, I hear you. That helped me, it's a win, and it made me to be, my esteem went a bit high. Everybody else who had written the opposite answer, now they were beaten. So the whole class was beaten except me. It helped me in one way or the other. Let us help our children that they can be able to start out. Let's not be authoritarian or dictatorial. Let's try and use other means. There are those parents who are authoritative. If you like, you may say democratic. If you like, you can say participatory. They inform their children. They seek to hear what is their children's view. They have rules, but they have also specified what are the consequences of the rules. They are also very consistent in the way they bring up their children. If that rule was said, that rule will be repeated tomorrow and the day after. They are consistent in the way they, they do. They validate their children's feeling. Do not wait for somebody to tell your child you will be the best business person this world has uh, ever had. You will grow to become an influencer in your generation. You are meant for big things. Who will tell your children that if you don't tell them? Is it the teacher? Is it the, had, the Sunday school somebody? A teacher? Who will do that? It is you who must affirm them, who must validate them, who must make sure that they feel they belong and somebody values them. And they use positive discipline strategies. As you discipline, you let the child know the reason why I'm disciplining you. And then we agree on how can we make sure that tomorrow this does not happen. And unless it's a demonic issue, because there's a father in the, in the neighborhood who told me, his son would wait for vehicles coming out from church. Then he would take stones and start throwing stones at the cars. He had beaten the child until now he had felt, no, I can't beat him anymore. And he called the child and he hugged the boy. And he prayed with the boy, cried. The boy even cried. Do you know that was a turning point for that boy? That was a turning point. Sometimes, when the things now get out of hand, not whenever, not when they get out of hand, God must be partner with us. And Anne will be talking about it as she concludes. We need to have God as a partner in our bringing up the, the, the children. As they hear us pray for them, speaking good things about them in their lives, then it becomes a good thing. An authoritative parent, that participatory, that democratic parent, enforce the children, builds their self-esteem, make sure that they encourage them and set out every day with blessings. Go and conquer the world. Go and be the best child in the school. The teachers will show you favor. You will be the favored among your, uh, the, the colleagues in the class and so forth. That child will be somebody different. Then we have permissive parent, indulgent parent. Now, these parents are very lenient. They will come up with the rules, but they will never follow through the rules. 
they will allow their children to be who, whatever they want to do. That is why if the child asks for kukumzima, the father or the mother goes and buys the kukumzima and chips and a big soda. And the child eats until they can't breathe. And the father is saying, oh, my child is very happy. That is not loving your children, your, your child. You're destroying your child. So these indulgent parents, permissive, they allow their, anything to go. Usually, they take on more of a friend's role instead of a, a parent. They are friends. They are bad days with their child. No, uyu muache, anafanyanga ivo. And they'll come to your house and break glasses. I have seen kids who have come to a house and you're waiting for them. When will these ones leave? Because they have put everything, <laughs> they're everywhere. And they're putting things. They're dropping things. They can't let you speak with their father or their mother. You are preparing a very dangerous somebody that you release to the world. You think you're doing them favor by allowing them to be free picking things and dropping things in the supermarket, it will not work. It will, be, it will have consequences later on in the future. So, be the parent to your child. Let discipline, use positive strategies to discipline your child. It will help. Children of this kind of parents will likely struggle academically. Remember the young girl I told you about who was looking for a parent who will do anything. That mother and father thought by making sure that money is available, and there was a lot of money in the, in the house, the girl would be brought to the school in a Mercedes Benz. But when she sits down, she sits on the bare, the, the cloth can't cover when she sits because it is too short. The Mercedes used to park right at the entrance to the school so that there will be no cut calls out there. And from extremely well up. It's a family that is known, extremely well up. But this girl was saying, I wish my dad could tell me you will not. I will not allow this. I wish mom could tell me don't. But there was nobody. The parents had put money, a lot of money. If you want to go to carnival, if you want to go and sleep out, if you want to go where, the children were there. A permissive parent. These children are, of course, at the highest risk of health, because they are the ones who eat anything and drink anything without anybody to tell them that you must take your vegetables, as we had early alone. The children, of course, develop very low uh, self-esteem, very low self-esteem as they grow up. And finally, we have a parent that we call the uninvolved parent. They are absent in a child's life. And we said being available in a child's life is paramount, it's very important. Be the supporter number one. They tend to have very little knowledge of what their children is, are doing or even where their child is. Ukikutana ya kwa jia uulize mtoto wako wako wapi, hajui, na mtoto wako gedhorai. Ye, anafikiri ya kotu huku zima. Lakini mtoto wako gedhorai, the child knows where the combine harvester is. I'm saying this because we did that. Going to where they're harvesting gano. Because there will be other things that we would eat in the process. And you'd follow them for kilometers. Until you realize you're so far from home, how do you go back home? Yeah, they are the ones that I was showing my wife, they are being called regents. Because you must justify you went looking for kuni. You are coming home at 8, at 8 p.m. Uh, they, they tend to give very few rules, if any, and children do not receive any guidance, any nurturing. Nobody is there to help them to motivate them, to build them, to encourage them. Both the parents are absent, they are uninvolved in the child's life, and so on. And they don't devote any time or much of their energy to the child's basic needs. Like what did the teacher say? Or, kwani walimu wanafikita tutakuwa tunashida kwa shule? The father or the mother has never stepped into that school. They normally said the house girl. Or they said some relative who stays with them. Those children, they are like foreigners. And finally, you find that these parents, many of them, 
Sometimes they don't even know that they are doing this. It is simply because they are everywhere looking on ways on how to thrive instead of looking for ways in which they can help their children. Could be because they are busy doing a lot of things. Somebody go to and ABCD. They have no time. Let the child, the child feeds for themselves. And I know you, we, we know and about them. We see this during Conqueror's Conference. Where the child, the parent has no idea mtoto wa kwa church na amekura anarudi nyubani anataka kurara. We are asking, we are saying, let us be involved in our children's life. The challenge is, this kind of child, they struggle a lot with self-esteem. Because they grew, they grew up seeing other children walking with their parents to church, being brought to school. During the parents' day, the parents are there, but they know my mom or my dad will never come. They know that. Actually, if they, get, they ever see a parent, that will be the greatest shock. But they know my dad or my mom will never be there. They tend to perform poorly in the school. Because we said how you bring them up, you influence what they become as they're growing up. They tend to perform poorly in school. You find them in one corner. You can imagine everybody else has been visited during the visiting day in high school, but only your son or your daughter did not get somebody. As the others are eating and celebrating with their parents, this one, nobody remembered him. And it happened from one, from two, from three. Now they are in form four. And they have behavioral problems. These are the children who will start misbehaving in school. There will be a problem to everybody else, and it will be a big challenge to bring them up and to take care of them. Many of them may start some delinquent behavior when they are still in high school. And conclude for us. Thank you, Peter. And as he was talking about the uninvolved parent, I remembered when uh, we were asked to take our children back to school, I think it was a Wednesday, and then Monday they were asked to be in school, or Tuesday, and someone tweeted and said, they're asking us to take our children back to school and we don't even know where they are. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so such a parent is one who may not tell where the child is at any one particular time. Now finally, brethren, so let us decide to partner with God in bringing up our children. It is God who works in us both to will and to do that which is right in his eyes. Let's ask God for help. Now remember, children are a gift from God. Now this is what Psalm 127 says. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders build labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hearts of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. And I like the last bit. Now, blessed is the man whose quiver is, is full. So let's go and multiply and have more children. And as we do that, now let us partner with God. Let's ask God for help. Sometimes you'll be in a situation whereby you don't understand what is happening with this child. And I have seen that a lot of times. You're like, God, now who, who gave birth to this child? You know? <laughs> whose son or whose daughter are you? Let us run to ask God. Because unless the Lord builds the city, now the builders do it in vain. And the watchmen may start guard in vain. Now that tells and calls us to have a lot of prayers with our children and for our children. Now, the next thing is let's purpose to do our best as parents. We shall sit back. When we are old and gray, we shall sit back and say we did good. Now Proverbs 10.1 says a wise child makes a father glad but a foolish child brings sorrow to his mother. I guess it's to both. Eh? <laughs> but the mother and the father will be happy if they bring up a wise child. Let us be very, very deliberate in the things that we do with and for our children, right from birth up to the time they leave our hands. And I can promise us we shall sit back, watch, and be happy. That time that when they are required to honor and respect us, now we shall really get a hundredfold for we planted a good seed. And lastly, dear parents, now let us also take care of ourselves. 
Take care of yourself as a parent. Because the moment you are mentally unstable, or you are not physically fit, no, you will not be able to bring up your child. And I think you can bear me witness. Now, once you are stressed and your emotions are running wild, now you also take out that stress on your children and you are not able to decide very well what to do and what not to do and they suffer a lot. So may the Lord help us. May the Lord be with all of us as we partner with him and we, and we try and we pull up our socks in bringing up godly offspring. The Lord bless you. I just want to conclude with just one thing I've remembered. As you bring up children, these children tend to be quite intelligent. And they will ask you for something. You say no, then they will wait for the daddy and come and ask. If the two of you don't consult, they will make you fight. Remember, there's a life after bringing up the children. The two of you will be left behind. And you must know where do you start. You can start by partnering in bringing up the children it will make it easier after you have left the home. Because many families are now finding it very difficult because they were talking through the children, they were managed by the children, and now the children have left, and you don't know from there on how do you move on. Let's take care of our marriages so that we can bring up our children knowing that these, two, these children will leave us. And when they leave, I'll still be left with her. We must know to takana mnagani between the two of us as we get into the old age. And that time they'll be visiting us from wherever they are in the world. They'll be visiting us. But we shall be left to spend the rest of our lives together. Thank you so much. And may God bless you even as you do that noble task of bringing up his children. Because these are gifts from God. Amen. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have heard it straight from, I will not say from the horse's mouth, but I'll say from Peter and Anne, and I can attest that they have really hammered it home. And the, the, the young couples and the young parents in the, in the house will agree with me and they'll say that it was nice, eh? it fry. So thank you so much, and uh, we are going to have two questions that we'll post to both Peter and Anne. But before we do that, uh, I'll also want to give my take home. And I also want to resonate with what they are saying about uh, every child coming with his own personality or her own personality. And the way of raising them cannot be the same. So I agree. I think we are in child number. Not I think. I know we are in child number four. And I can attest that every one of them come with their own personality. I also agree with them when they say that, uh, uh, not really agree, but learning from them that I should explain the rules and the regulations that I have in the house. I think I'm that parent who usually say that I'm saying this because ni mimi baba, ni mimi mesema, and I'm learning that I need to explain that. And uh, before I, I pose the question that I want to ask Peter, I'll ask uh, my wife Edna also to share her take home. So the two questions that we want to pose, the first one goes to Peter. Now, the 21st century father is in a dilemma. Some of them were brought up in families where the fathers were a bit, I, want, I don't want to call it abusive, but a bit authoritarian, to the point that the fathers feared having a conversation with their dads. Now, when they have become fathers, they have vowed not to do that to their own children. And in retrospect, it has affected the way they, have, they are disciplining them. Maybe you can take a minute or two, maybe to counsel them on how they can instill discipline 
but at the same time not maybe put off the children or make them run away. Now, Edna, can you also ask a question to answer that they can answer together? Uh, my, my question to Anne, uh, I'm going to put it like this. For example, we have parents, both the father and mother are working in very busy environments. And maybe they leave too early and come very late at home. Uh, if these parents choose to take their kids to boarding school in lower classes, maybe as early as class one or grade one as it is, or as early as grade four, do you think it is wise or godly as a parent to take their children to boarding school because they feel they'll be safer there rather than being home where mom and dad is not there and leaving them to be brought up by nannies or house managers. Do you think it's wise as parents, as Christian parents, to take our children to boarding school as early as we may want to? Thank you. Those are excellent questions. <clears throat> They're actually the challenges that we are facing today. Um, and if I may answer the first question about the fathers that were brought up by fathers who are dictators, you know, authoritarian parents, parents who never gave you a chance to be had in your home. And now that you have your own home, you have decided to go the other extreme, maybe to be permissive, giving your child everything and A, B, C, D, until you're not able to discipline that child. Because you always, whenever you want to discipline your child, you remember how your father was disciplining you. What I would say and what I commented is, one of the things is that, um, one, we have not been taken to any institution to learn how to parent. Unlike the career that you do, you have been reading and, going to, and learning about your career since you joined nursery school. And now you're so prepared, when you're 20 something and you're finished your college or university, you are ready to go out and start working. But parenthood, it comes. You are not prepared. You're excited about love and so on. And then a baby comes. Now you know how do you start from there. And you have fears that you may end up being like your father or your mother who was so authoritarian. It is important that you first keep on looking for additional knowledge on how best to be a good parent. How best can you help your child to, to grow? And because you don't have, the only manuscript you have is the things that have been registered in your mind of how your father or your mother behaved. The chances for you doing exactly like that is possible. Or you doing the opposite, whereby you become a permissive parent, where your children can do anything and you don't ask, what are you the baba, you the mama, you know, an ABCD. But now, as we have said, that kind of parenting will expose your children or will bring up, will make you to bring up children that are not good members of the society, good in quotes, in that their contribution, their self-esteem is affected, their performance in school is, perform is, is, is affected, even their personality becomes affected. So you must remember, some discipline is important. And discipline, I'm saying in quotes, because we said, look for positive strategies on how to manage discipline. Fighting or beating a child is not always a solution. Actually, as I said myself, I haven't beaten. But there could be other disciplinary strategies that you can use. When you say you will go to sleep by seven, you'll be in your room by seven, and she knows or he knows at eight there is that program that we like watching. And now you're saying you have been grounded. You will be in your room. And we are saying we will not buy ABCD for you because this is what you have done. And you have explained clearly. Now, the child will know that it is their behavior that has caused them not to get that ABCD that you are to buy. So you can deny some privileges that the child would have gotten into. And I tell you, 
beating sometimes is not good. Sometimes you beat, you might beat, and feel like the child is not feeling anything. And what happens? You now keep on beating, and you may end up injuring your own child. And Kwanza Kumpereka Hospitali, and so on. And of course, a hostile relationship that builds on from there on. So use other disciplinary mechanisms, other strategies that can help you to manage your child and to help your child to grow up in the right way without necessarily resorting to how your father or your mother used to, the authoritarian type. That kind of discipline where you want to cause pain, where you want to cause sorrow, is not right. That's why we are saying deny privileges. Deny other things that the child you know they like. Deny them a chance to go out and play with friends. Let them know that they must, whatever they did was wrong, and therefore they cannot go out. This week, they will be expected to stay indoors. But again, there is the extent to which you can go to. You might be told you will not eat for two days. Does a child know how to fast? And you know this is fast fasting. So again, there are certain privileges that you cannot deny. Look for ways in which you can be huddled. At Assisi to Kichapua, our parents first used to make sure that you have eaten. Yeah? You have eaten. Alafu nabiwa ulete gunia. Ulale iri. That unga is is I don't know how that... I'm trying to get it from my mother tongue. So, ukichapo you're already full. Ukiria, unaeda kurala, you sleep immediately. So, but you remember you are punished. But what you have said, very important. The child must know why they are being disciplined. Secondary, do not withhold discipline for a long time. There are parents who will wait. Goja mpaka baba ataku. And the father is coming one month down the line. He has been visiting. Maybe out of the country or wherever it is, he was on duty and so forth. Now the father is coming to be told, you know immediately you left. Your daughter did A, B, C, D. That girl has even forgotten what she did. So if you start beating her, and she has already forgotten, that there can never be the impact, the impact that you want. Discipline is best served when it is still hot. When the action is still hot, that they can be able to relate. Don't keep it. You will cause that child to have ulcers as they keep on thinking, Sasa, how will it be? And so thank you, Peter, for that. And uh, as he, wa he was talking, I was uh, remembering or reminding myself what it means to be a 21st century parent. Now, one other thing we could do is let us not sit back and say, easy ni vitu za siku hizi, I know nothing about that. So get to learn what is it that your child is watching. When they say, I don't know, they are recording for TikTok, get to know what TikTok is and what it is or about. If they say they want to watch programs on Nickelodeon, get to know what it is, what is that or about. If they tell you they are on Instagram, you may not be on Instagram yourself, but find out what happens on Instagram. Otherwise, your child could be posting very bad photos and things that uh, may actually may not be healthy for them and for everybody else. So learn a few things, watch a movie with them. When that Jerusalem dance thing came and it was everywhere, I told them, tell me about Jerusalem dance. Who sang it? Why is it being sung and stuff like that? Not that we may dance it in the house. I doubt that he will allow us. I don't know. <laughs> But I wanted to really find out what are the lyrics? What is it all about? So we may not sit back and say we belong to the 19th and the 20th century, so we will not watch, we will not do one, two, three. Find out what it is that the children of the 21st century are doing because we belong to a different century, but we are parenting in a different century with different challenges. Get in there, find out, watch the movie with them, go to that place with them, so that when you tell them, this movie will not be watched here, this channel we are blocking, or this place you will not go again, then they understand why you are telling them it is not good for them. Now back to the question on taking a, a child to boarding school when they are very, very young. Now we reiterate that it is our responsibility to bring up children. It is not the responsibility of the household, it is not the responsibility of the teachers in the boarding schools it is still our responsibility to bring up our children. Now, I 
recognize or reckon with the fact that uh, we must work hard to provide for their needs and we must work hard to ensure that we store something for them. But it's good to know that it is better to invest in our children than to invest for our children. Now let us make sacrifices where we can. One of us can sacrifice and take a job that is less involving. I'm not saying we don't go to work. Both of us work. But we haven't taken our children to boarding schools because that is giving somebody else a responsibility of your child, especially at such young, tender age. Now, there used to be a primary boarding school where I come from, nearby. And one of my brothers, actually three of them, my brother and my two young sisters were taken. They're not because mom was not home. Mom was a primary school teacher in the hood, so she could afford to go with them and all that where she was teaching. But she wanted a better education for the children. So she said the boarding school is better. Why the uko wakasome, they have all the time. And they were taken there, the three of them. So sometimes I would come and visit them. And you were seeing class one. My, our, my brothers were not that small. Eh? They were taken for class six, seven, and eight. But that scene in the morning, mtoto ameamuka, amejikojolea from head to toe. It is porridge time in the morning. And they are queuing for porridge and shaking, you know? Because the people who are working in the school, they have no time. I to wake up, bathe, I dress you, and stuff like that. Now, they're huddling hundreds of children. So when I saw class one children, they haven't bathed. Nobody has taken care of them. They are queuing for porridge. Another teacher will be waiting with a stick outside the class in case they get late, and stuff like that. Then I decided I will never, ever take my child to a boarding school especially at the primary level. No, they need you most at this level. Now remember this is where we said, up to age 12, going 13, they need to learn to obey rules, especially in the house. And rules are not just about bells. No, rules about everything, the kind of words they use, the places they go and the kind of stuff they, 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 they need to do in their lives. So we must work out. Now make a sacrifice. One of us, or the two of us, and be with our children. I honor mothers and fathers who have decided I will not take up that promotion so that I can be home with my children. Now, the other day we had a discussion with my friends, and one of them is afraid of losing her international status because now COVID made her to stay home. And because she's international staff, she comes home like three times in a year. And the other one said, I decided I will not take that international job. Not that it wasn't offered, it was offered, but she decided to be local staff. And this is how she put it. I want to be here, she has girls. I want to be here when my girls get their first period. I want to be here when my girls are approached by a boy or the boys that would really be their friends. I want to know them and I want to be there. Not that both of them, I looked at them and I said, uh, not that they are so different economically. Because life has a way of bringing us to a particular level, all of us. So if you look at the people you went to school with, even those that I went to school with, those, I wasn't the number two, three, four kind of girl, I was a number one or number two. And those ones that were number 90, like him, see now he's my husband here. Now look at that, look at that, look at that. So let's make sacrifices when we can, knowing that we don't have our children at that age forever. Now it is better for them to be home. You make a sacrifice, you run, you drive maybe, or you run, you make a sacrifice here, take a day off, take them to clinic, come for the function and go back to work. It is better for you when your child is at home. However busy you are, you can create some time and be with them rather than them being away where you can only see them once in a month. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think the statement for the day is invest in your children, not for your children. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of our seminar today. We want to give a special thanks to our speakers today, Anne and uh, Peter Macharia. Thank you for taking your time and also teaching us invaluable lessons on parenting and child upbringing. 
We also want to thank the Deliverance Church Zimmerman for giving us this platform as the Kaposa Glue Ministry to speak to our members and to, the, and to the whole group at large so that we can raise good families, families that fear the Lord, and also we can become good couples as God intended. I also want to ask that those who are here physically, thank you for making time, even those who are there online, we also thank you and appreciate your time. Uh, there is a cup of tea that is prepared for you as we wind up, so don't be quick to move out. And uh, also await more information about our next seminar. At this time, we will invite Edna to close for us with a word of prayer. May God bless you and see you soon. Let's pray. Our Father, one in heaven, we come before you once again. We want to say thank you so much for being with us throughout this seminar. Thank you for the knowledge and wisdom that you granted Anne and Peter Marshalia to share with us today. Father, as we now wind up, Lord, we want to pray that whatever you've learned, O oh Lord, may you help us so that we may put it in practice and continue partnering with us as you bring up great uh, ladies and gentlemen, O oh God, in this world who are going to change this world for the better. We thank you and we bless you so much for guiding us. For this we pray, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.